This is the chapter five, lesson one and lesson two homework on probability. Um, and in this first lesson, uh, we're guiding question, I want you to think about what probability means. So what's the probability of a specific outcome mean in terms of the law of large numbers? That's very crucial to probability uh, for the short term and for the long term. That's what I want you to focus on as we look through this. And we use a lot of dice games, Roulette, cards as ways of referencing probability in this chapter. So the idea of probability is that uh, we assign a number to an event uh, that gives it a chance of occurring. Zero being never, so that being the smallest value, and one being 100%, meaning always. Now, the law of large numbers is key to us in statistics and probability, and also when we look at uh, sampling later on and sampling distributions. Um, so more repetitions is always better. So the more proportion of times that a single event occurs, uh, so if we did something infinitely, then that would be its probability. So if we get a large sample size, and then we get a, the amount of successes of an event, then that would just be an estimate of its probability. If we imagined extending that to infinity and seeing how many successes it was, that would truly be the event's probability. Now, over a small number of trials, the proportion by chance may not reflect the probability. So that's why we may know probabilities of outcomes in casino games, but that doesn't mean they're actually gonna occur. Um, that's why some people still sometimes come out on top in casinos. Very few, because probability is in the casino's favor. So we'll be talking about that as we go too. So keep in mind this law of large numbers, it's very key that probability tells us how often a chance process should occur over a large number of trials. It doesn't dictate what's going to happen in one, two, or out of 10 trials. If the chance of something happening is 60%, that doesn't mean when you do it 10 times, you're going to get six successes every time. Uh, you could get four. You could get one even uh, just by chance. So keep in mind that probability is not a rule. It's the percent of times in a chance event occurs over the, in the long term. So you always want to use the long term to describe it. What are some myths about probability? Let's look at them. So one thing about our nature wants to tell us that this random phenomena should be predictable in the short term, in addition to the long term. We want to be able to know, okay, then uh, I just got black three times in roulette, it's going to be red next time. Something about people's brains wants to say that, but that's not the case. Um, in roulette, spins of the wheel are independent. That means previous outcomes don't affect the next outcome. Could have been 10 blacks in a row, that doesn't change the probability of black or red on the next roll. It's still just under 50%. Um, so even in a really large number of chance occurrences, our outcome may not exactly match the probability. But as we increase the number of trials, our number should approach the true proportion or the probability of an event. Okay? So one, it's not, it doesn't dictate outcomes, probability. It gives you uh, the overall number of times something is expected to occur in a large number of trials, like a very, very large number of trials. So it doesn't dictate anything. And as we increase the number of trials, uh, our number of successes should, a number of chance occurrences should approach the probability. We oftentimes simulate events in order to uh, determine their probabilities. So we use the state, plan, do, and conclude uh, format when we do that, where you state the question of interest about a chance process and defining whatever variable x is going to be, um, whether it's the rolling the dice or the chance that x equals 8, the sum of two dice, two six-sided dice when you roll them. You would state all that and define what the variable is going to be. Plan. How are you going to use a chance device? Are you going to use something online? Are you going to roll the two dice yourself? Are you going to use your calculator with random integers? And what variable to measure? Like what calculations do you need to use? Do perform the repetitions of the simulation and conclude by calculating what the probability is and using the simulation that you did to answer the question of interest up here. So basic state plan, do, conclude. Uh, we may be able to determine if an outcome is not plausible based on a simulation um, that shows the probability is highly unlikely. Um, if we can determine that an outcome is plausible, that doesn't necessarily mean the process was fair. We'll look at a little um, an example of this in class when we get started with it. Um, determining plausibility, something could be plausible, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily fair. Um, is it possible that an outcome happens? It might seem unlikely, but there's still a 10% chance, 10% still 1 in 10 times, so it's plausible. Um, so keep in mind our simulation can let us know if something's not plausible. It can be an estimation of the probability, but it's only going to be an estimate. 
if we had a lot of trials, then that estimate should improve, but it depends on what simulation we're using. So that's 5.1, a basic introduction to probability, where the real key is that probability does not dictate, dictate short-term outcomes. It dictates things in the, it doesn't dictate anything. It tells us what we should expect in the long run, meaning in many, many trials. It doesn't determine what will happen in five trials or 10 trials, even 100 or 1,000. We could do 1,000 trials and still have our number be slightly different. However, the more trials we do, the proportion of times a chance of process occurs should approach the probability. Now, as we go into 5.2, I want you to think about the basic probability rules, their terms and respective definitions, and then the free response question, uh, in addition to what does probability mean from 5.1, is going to be what is the difference between mutually exclusive and independent. Okay, so that's a key thing that many students confuse. So really focus on that with this video and going over examples in your book and looking back over it. So first, let's talk about a sample space. When we say sample space, it's all the uh, possible outcomes of a chance process. So this is the sample space of rolling two dice. Uh, it's also in your book, figure 5.2. Um, it kind of runs off here, but these are all sixes on the far right. So the sample space is all possible outcomes. Six-sided dice, so it's six, one, two, three, four, five, six, by six, so there's 36 possible outcomes. You can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six there. So our sample space can cons consists of 36 possible outcomes. So when we talk about the sample space S of an event, this is what we're talking about, all possible outcomes. So a probability model is a description of the some chance process uh, that would give us the sample space S and then the probability for each outcome. So in this case, here's our sample space. Each of these has an equally likely chance of occurring since the pro probability of rolling a one here is one sixth and a one here is one sixth. So each of these is assigned a probability of one thirty-six since one six times one six equals one thirty six. So for coin flip, our sample space uh, would be all pro all possible combinations of heads and tails. Uh, so we'd have heads, 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 tails, 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 heads. Four possible outcomes in the sample space. Uh, the probability of a heads equals the probability of a tails, which is 0.5 or one out of two times. Okay, so this is how we use probability notation. This means the probability of the outcome in parentheses. So for a roll of one six-sided die, our sample space, we'd write like this. Now notice we use these different brackets for sample space with a little squiggly. So the sample, these are our outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six. For rolling one one-sided, one, uh, one six-sided die, and the probability of each of those outcomes is one six. So I could write P of one equals one six, P of two equals one six, and so on. So an event is any collections of outcomes from our chance process, like the probability of rolling uh, snake eyes one one when we're rolling two sided two six sided di dice. Um, it could be a subset of the sample space, some combination of the outcomes. So it could be the probability of rolling uh, snake eyes twice in a row would be a subset of the sample space. And we can usually ad designate these events uh, A, B, C, D. What's the probability of A? And then we say that A is rolling two snake eyes in a row, meaning rolling one, one, and then one, one again. So an event would be something that we define that we want to find the probability of. Um, and it could be in our sample space or a combination of outcomes from our sample space. The basic probability rules. Uh, any event, the chance of it happening, the smallest number could be a zero, the largest number could be as one. Uh, if a probability is equal to zero, that means it never happens. A probability is equal to one means it always happens. So if you change those into percents, you'd have zero percent and a hundred percent. If S is a sample space and a probability model, the sample, the probability, the sample space occurs as one. That means your sample space includes all possible outcomes. So the probability that one of the outcomes from the sample space occurs has, is defined as being 100%. That just means your sample space represents all possible outcomes. Okay, now to find the probability of something, you would, in the numerator, find the number of outcomes corresponding to event A, and in the denominator, total number of outcomes possible in the sample space. So rolling a uh, one one on the dice. Um, one time, one thing in our sample space corresponds to that, 36 outcomes in our sample space, so the chance is 1 over 36. Now, if we said the probability that event A was uh, the two dice add up to 3, there's two ways that can happen, a 1 and a 2, and a 2 and a 1. 
So we'd have two outcomes out of 36, or one out of 18 would be our probability if that was our event. Okay? Um, so here you have 1 18th, since two possible outcomes occur. Um, now, the probability that an event occurs, does not occur, is the complement. So if the probability of this occurring is 1 18th, the two, die, the two dice sum to three, the complement of that event is that it doesn't occur. So that means um, 17 out of 18 times would be the complement. So one minus this probability gives us the complement. Now, often, um, oftentimes we use the complement because it's easier sometimes to find the complement of, of an event and then from there subtract it from one in order to, to, to determine the probability we're looking for. Um, so the complement means the probability that the event does not occur. So when you add the probability of an event plus the probability of its complement, they have to equal one or in percents, 100%. So if our sum it doesn't equal three, that'd be the complement of event A we subtract one minus the probability of A. So that would give us 34 over 36 or 17 out of 18. Now, those two events, the complement of A and A, have no outcomes in common. That means you either roll, uh, you have the roll and, and the two dice add to three or they don't add to three. That means those two events are mutually exclusive. When one occurs, when the dice add to three, the other can occur. When the dice don't add to three, they can't add to three too. So when two events don't have any intersection, meaning if we picture this as event A occurring and this is event B, here's the dice sum to three, the dice don't sum to three. There's no overlap. The dice can't possibly sum to three and not sum to three. Other examples are like mutually exclusive events are you being at school and you being absent. Both can't happen. So if you're not at school, then the probability that you're absent, uh, that you're at school is zero. So when mutually exclusive events occur, that means when one occurs, the other doesn't. So they're not independent. When one occurs, it changes the probability that the other occurs. So because there's no intersection, meaning no, they have no outcomes in common, the probability of A or B occurring, you just add up the two. There's no overlap. They both can't possibly occur. So these all are all examples, the complement of A and A. There's no outcomes that these share. Now these are Venn diagrams. We're gonna use these to represent probability of outcomes in the probability chapter. So mutually exclusive means two events can't both happen. If one happens, the other does not. So drawing a heart and drawing a spade from a deck, those are mutually exclusive events when drawing one card. So if we define our event as drawing one card, they both can occur. You can't draw a heart and a spade. Now drawing a heart and a seven are not mutually exclusive events because you could draw the seven of hearts. Those are not mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive means when one event occurs, the second cannot. Now notice here, the probability that A occurs and its complement, meaning it doesn't occur, equals one, because that represents all possible outco outcomes. Here, when these two circles don't overlap at all, there's no intersection, that means they're mutually exclusive. So take a close look at these diagrams. These are also in your book. Uh, we call this here's event A, here's event B. Where they overlap means both can occur. So these two events are not mutually exclusive because here in this area it represents them both occurring. We call this their intersection. So when two events have an intersection, that means they both occur. So for here we're talking about male and pierced ears. So these would represent males with pierced ears. These would represent the males without pierced ears. And these would represent other people with pierced ears. So if they're not male, that'd be females with pierced ears. So those two events can both happen and that event represents the intersection. So here we have the intersection is in green. Now, when they both happen, that's the intersection. When we talk about either happening, we say the union. And N right here is the intersection. So A intersect B is that space right there when they both occur. When we say A union B, that's this U here, that means either one of them occur. So A or B happens. That means what's the probability that A or B happens if we say A union B. Now, if they're mutually exclusive, you just add the two up, the probability of A plus B for the union. However, these events have an overlap. So when we add A and B, we'd be counting this section twice. So when, there's, when they're not mutually exclusive, we add the probability of A plus the probability of B. Then we have to subtract that because we don't want to add it twice. That's what's showed in this general addition rule. So if these are two events are not mutually exclusive. So that's how you add them up. Now go over this in your book. Here's your multiple choice. 
Here's the multiple choice question, so please pause now and answer that, then look over the lesson in your book and answer the free response.